So um, let's start. Stream diagrams. Um, stream diagrams are a very big field in uh, pipe category theory at the moment, and probably one of the things that really motivated uh, and you know gave applied category theory boost. So what stream diagrams are about is um, they are a way to make category theory to do and work in category theory graphically. Now, the idea of working, um, of doing mathematics graphically is actually not old at all, is probably the most ancient way of doing mathematics we know. Like if you, if you look at ancient Greece, you know, the first rigorous formalizations of geometry and stuff like that, uh, they didn't use equational reasoning uh, in any way. It was just, you know, proofs by drawing triangles and circles in the sand and, and proving things using some postulates, basically. Um, then, uh, you know, uh, time uh, went by, uh, we invented um, in other layers of abstraction and somehow this graphical um, reasoning fell out of fashion, I think in the last century, maybe 19th century. Uh, and so, you know, things were very different. It's like, oh, I have these nice pictures to prove this thing. And, but mathematicians would just tell you, well, they are just pictures. So not a real thing, basically. And, uh, but, but people still kept using uh, graphical reasoning to do uh, stuff. They would then formalize uh, their insights in, uh, let's say, standard mathematics. Uh, but for instance, people like Feynman or Roger Penrose used heavily uh, diagrammatic formalisms and graphical tools to really reason about um, the stuff they, they were interested in. And in particular, uh, Roger Penrose is an important figure in the history of string diagrams because uh, he devised these graphical calculus for uh, doing uh, tensor calculations. He was concerned, I believe, with general relativity and this sort of stuff. And he invented this graphical formalism to do uh, calculations uh, about like tensor products and, and these sort of things that can really become very, very much messy and cluttered when, when you do them uh, just, you know, by hand. Um, and this idea was then uh, picked up uh, and, you know, uh, basically some people proved that this diagrammatic formalism wasn't just something that, you know, Penrose made up, but it was consistent and complete. Uh, and so it could be used uh, to do mathematics. So uh, in this sense, the most important uh, result probably in the history of string diagram is this uh, theorem due to Joyal and Street in which they prove that actually working with some kind of string diagrams, so doing mathematically doing mathematics uh, graphically is equivalent to proving statements uh, concerning some particular kinds of categories. And, you know, these basically gave, again, a formal um, flavor to everything um, we can do with string diagrams. And, and then the field kept going. Uh, at the moment, there are literally like hundreds of people working on string diagrams in different ways. Um, one applications, uh, so some applications of this, for instance, are in a categorical quantum mechanics, uh, where you can basically use string diagrams to prove uh, stuff about quantum protocols. Uh, there is, um, there are wiring diagrams. This is the kind of stuff also David was hinting at. You can do system theory, um, parallel computing. There, there are really plenty of formalisms that can be um, studied uh, purely graphically. Uh, so uh, references, I'm really not good at giving references, but uh, I'll try to do my best. So if you're really interested in how string diagrams work and you know, all the, there isn't by the way, one particular kind of string diagrams. It's string diagrams are more like of a sort of a jungle. There are various different flavors of string diagrams. So probably, if you're interested in looking at them, and this is still one of the best surveys. I copy pasted uh, this link uh, in, the, in the chat. This is a paper by Peter Selinger, where you know, he presents 
a lot of different kinds of string diagrams um, and you know gives you the logical and categorical details about them. Uh, if you are interested in doing category theory string diagrams, then there is this uh, excellent uh, paper uh, by uh, Dan Marston. I will put it in the chat as well. One second. And this is a way more, let's say, operative. It's literally like, it's, a, it's the archive link. Yeah, this is the other one. Sorry. Oh. Oh, sorry, I'm messaging someone privately. I don't know why. Okay, sorry. Okay, so this is the link by uh, Marston. Uh, this is the one by Peter Selinger. Uh, wait a second, why well, can't copy, copy. Okay, and then there is, if you really look like, you know, using string diagrams to work, then an excellent reference is also Bob Cookes and Alex Kissinger's book, Picturing Quantum Processes, uh, where you know, they, they, they literally do quantum mechanics with string diagrams. So you can see first uh, hand how, how useful they can be. Okay, so this said, uh, I will switch my camera. Now you should be able to see my hands. And so I will basically draw on this piece of paper and and do stuff. Okay, so what are string diagrams? Uh, as we said, it's a way to do category theory graphically. So I will start with a very, very, very simple flavor of string diagrams, actually so simple to be incredibly boring, but this will be useful to understand what's going on later on. So we say that in a category, we have objects, that's A, let's say that they are A, B, C, and we have morphisms. Uh, there are various ways to denote them, but this is one, for instance, you know, say F goes from A to B. Um, so what we can do now is that we can notice that, especially in this kind of formalism, you know, uh, objects are akin to zero dimensional objects. They are like dots. And morphisms are actually one dimensional objects. They are arrows. I think this was uh, very clear from uh, even in, in, in the first tutorial because many people ask, you know, what, what is the relationship between graphs and categories? I mean, some category theory, uh, category theoretical concepts look like graphs after all, it's full of directed edges and, and points. So what we can do is, let's try to switch things around. So objects are points and morphisms are lines. Now we do the opposite. Objects become lines and morphisms become points. So what I can do is that I can rewrite this thing in this way. These are exactly the same thing. Um, so, you know, you say, okay, well, what do we get from this? Well, <clears throat> one thing that we can do now is we can define some uh, let's say syntactic sugar, uh, because in a category we always have identity morphisms. So no, we know that for each object, there is basically for each object A, we have a morphism that usually we call identity on A. That is like the do nothing morphism. Like we know that, for instance, if we plug any F after this, this is exactly the same thing as doing F. So we know we have this do nothing morphism. In, in this other view of the world where we say, okay, actually now morphisms are zero dimensional objects. So they, they can be depicted like box, basically like dots. And objects are now lines or wires. Uh, by the way, I'm reading this left to right. It's exactly as I'm reading this. Um, how can I represent an identity um, morphism. Well, the identity doesn't do anything, right? So the best way we can represent it is by not drawing it at all. We say that this is an identity. It's basically just an invisible box. And now we start seeing the advantages of this way of reasoning. Because for instance, 
what does it mean that we have this identity law here? Well, it's already implicit in our formalism now, because, you know, I'm just not drawing a box here. So this F going from A to B can either be F or F composed with the identity on A or F post composed with the identity on B. We can, we can plug, you know, as many identities here as we want. We don't draw them. So the point is that our graphical formalism now doesn't really see this different, this difference here. And this is right because, because of the categorical axioms, these are exactly the same thing. There is an equation here. So if these are the same thing, it makes total sense that we actually drew, draw them in the same way. And one um, consequence of this is that we can see that in our graphical formalism, we can slide things around. So, you know, it doesn't really matter where you draw F. And you can interpret this by saying, oh yeah, I'm actually considering an identity here or an identity here. So these boxes can literally slide along wires as long as the connectivity is preserved. So the mantra of string diagrams is that the only thing that matters is what is connected to what. So in this case, A is connected to F on the left, B is connected to F on the right. That's everything that matters. Okay. Um, so, oh, by the way, um, let, let me just spend a few word, more words on this. Uh, I'm drawing these diagrams left to right. Uh, there are various different conventions. Um, some people draw these diagrams top to bottom. So you may see them, uh, you may see them drawn in this way. And, you know, this goes up. But then other people actually, um, this is the convention in categorical quantum mechanics, for instance. But then other people draw them top to bottom. And this is the convention in language theory, in categorical language theory, usually. And also crowd, these different crowds really tend to hate each other when it comes to conventions. So at some point, some person thought actually, I will just use this that goes left to right is the way we read and, you know, so they, they leave me alone. I, I, I don't want to get into this uh, religion war. So at the moment, the only way we don't draw string diagrams is right to left. That's probably not done by anyone yet. So please don't start because that would be just another convention to deal with. Um, and so, yeah, okay. This is uh, this taster, you know, this initial kind of thing. Uh, you can already see that this graphical language is very convenient in embedding um, the categorical axioms. So, for instance, we know that in categories we have identities, but we also have another very important operation that is composition. So, how do we compose things? Well, let's see. We know that if I have F from A to B and I have G from B to C, I can just consider this composition, uh, F after G. And again, these are considered the same thing. But graphically, we know that this is a box right now. This, this, is, this is this thing here that goes from A to B. And now we have a G that goes from B to C. And how do we compose them? Well, this gives me a B here and this gets a B here. So it's the same wire. We just plug one into the other. And this is a really, really nice intuition because it gives you a process theoretic interpretation of what's going on. You can think about a morphism as something that takes an A and gives you a B. And this is taking a B and giving you a C. And the composition is saying, use the G on whatever F spits out. And this is exactly what we are doing here. We are connecting the wire. So really you have to think about these things as these are processes that they can literally be like Arduino 
uh, circuit boards with you know inputs and outputs like uh, electric wires or guitar amplifiers or house appliances whatever you want it's literally the same kind of concept as long you know if, if you connect um, your toaster to um, uh, the socket in the wall, it doesn't really matter how you bend the wire. What matters is that the socket is connected and so you have power in the toaster. This is exactly the same kind of thing. I'm out of focus, I don't know why. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so now let's try to do, why is this? Okay, so let's, hmm. can, can you... So the auto focus, the auto focus only tries to focus the center of the page. So if the center of the page is completely white. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave my hand there here. Right there. Yes, cool. Uh, okay, so now let's try to do something more complicated. Um, let's try to do two categories. What are two categories? Well, two categories are categories that are of morphisms between morphisms. So what does it mean? Well, we have objects A, B, we have morphisms like these ones, and then we have morphisms between morphisms. Um, this is uh, something also someone uh, asked uh, in the chat. And you know, the idea is that you, you can just keep going. There are obviously a lot of axioms that you have to um, formalize, to, to, to really formalize well this concept of two category. But the main idea is literally, we don't have just morphisms between objects, but morphisms between morphisms as well. Okay, so can we represent this graphically? I'm not going to tell you formally what a two category is also because it's super boring and super long. So. What I will do instead is I will give you a graphical calculus for it. And I will say, trust me, there's a theorem that says two categories are the same thing in that this graphical calculus. And then you will be able to work out a lot of nice things just by looking at how this calculus works. So what we did before was we had objects and they were zero dimensional, right? And then we have morphisms and they were one dimensional. And we basically inverted things in the string diagrams word. And we said, oh, actually I'm drawing objects as lines and morphisms are as dots. Cool. So what do we do now? Now we have objects and they are again, just points. So Zero, zero dimensional and we have morphisms and now they are one dimensional exactly as before but now we have these strange things here that are morphisms between morphisms and we can interpret them as surfaces basically so they are called two morphisms and they are two dimensional so what are we going to do in the string diagram word where we are doing the same thing we did here? We are switching things around. So you see now objects become two dimensional things. So an object will be a surface. And morphisms are one dimensional things uh, as before, as they were in the normal two categorical world. And so we draw them as lines basically. So a morphism from A to B will just be a line that is a boundary between A and B. And Let's call this F. And what is a two morphism? It's a dot. So is this. I have a G here and F here and this is Anita. Uh, I'm reading this bottom top. So I'm reading this left to right when it comes to one morphism and like bottom top when it's about two morphisms. 
unfortunately, I can't do better. Like I, I can find another convention that makes everyone happy. So I'm choosing button top and people that do top to button, please don't hate me. Um, and we can do the same trick with it before. Like how do I represent an identity between A and A itself? Well, I don't. If A is just the surface, it's just, the identity is just an invisible line, basically. How do I represent composition of morphisms? Well, again, composition of morphisms is already embedded in our graphical language. Like if this is F and this is G, and they go from A to B to C, their composition is just this. I, I don't have to write anything more. And you see that the associativity of composition is already respected. So, you know, if I have an age here, and this is a K, then from the picture, I know already that F composed with G parentheses composed with K is the same thing of composing F with G composed K because it's the same picture. It really turns into a tautology in this setting. How do you think I can uh, represent an I two identity? So an identity between morphisms. Well, guess what? We don't draw it. It's just an invisible box here. So you can already see from this graphical calculus that if you are going to do two categories, you will have um, a notion of identity morphism between morphisms. This is identity on F. And again, I didn't give you any formalization of two categories. I'm just showing you this stuff graphically. And how do you think we can compose these, um, these two morphisms, these strange morphisms between morphisms? Well, let's see. I have, again, my nice surface. This is my object A. And this is my object B. And now I have an F here. And I have an eta between F and some G. And I have a theta between G and some H. And this is just the composition of these two morphisms. I'm literally saying, I'm literally interpret this, interpreting this eta as a sort of a higher order process. I'm basically saying, take the process F, give me the process G using eta, and then use theta to give me the process H from G. And you can see, again, this composition will be associative because if I plug some other C here, uh, to get some other k, it really doesn't matter in which order I, I evaluate this, if it's this and then these two, or these two and then this. But even more interesting, interestingly, you will see that this vertical kind of composition of two morphisms is not the only one that there is. What do I mean is this. If I have Uh, if I have A here and I have B here and I have C here and then I have F and G, H and K, eta and theta, then what is happening here? We know that this eta is taking this F and giving me a G. And this theta is taking an H and giving me a K. But now if I read things in this direction, this is F composed with H, right? So I have F composed with H here. 
And in here, I have G composed with K. And so I can infer that I have a way of horizontally compose these two morphisms. So if I have a more, uh, two morphisms from F to G and one from H to K, and these can be composed together, then I can horizontally compose these two morphisms. And now we can already infer something even more interesting, that is this picture here. I have Now I take four two morphisms. I won't write any more surfaces and one morphism, otherwise this thing will become a mess. But let's say that I have eta and I have theta and I have psi and I have chi here. I take four of them. Now what can I do is I can do eta and then theta and then I can use this horizontal composition and do C and then chi, or I can do the horizontal stuff first and then composed with this, right? And now these two things have to be the same because I'm merely reading the same picture in two different ways. In this, way, in this case here, I'm considering this first and then I'm composing with this. In this case, I'm considering this first and then I'm composing with this. But that's just like the way I'm viewing the picture, but the picture is exactly the same. So then again, this graphical calculus automatically embeds these equations um, in. And we can prove exactly as we did in the stupid case with the one categories that, you know, these dots can be sled around uh, as long as they, you know, don't cross each other. So um, what I mean is that this is really equal to this. You know, you can, you can really slide and you can also contract uh, or shrink the surfaces. It doesn't really matter. The only thing that matters is that what is connected to what. Um, now, you can see that we can keep playing this trick. So that the whole thing that makes this work is that I, we had some zero dimensional object, then some one dimensional objects, two dimensional objects, blah, 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 blah. And we can go up to N, you know, we, we can basically consider categories that are called N categories where you have objects and then you have morphisms and then you have morphisms between morphisms, but then you also have morphisms between morphisms between morphisms. And then you can keep going, you know, and it, it, it up to N basically. And this exactly, for, for these categories, we have exactly the same idea. Like, how can I do this stuff graphically? Well, basically by sending zero to N, one to N minus one, blah, 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 and this goes here. So you see that, for instance, in the case of three categories, I will be able to speak also of spaces. An object will actually be a space and a morphism will actually be a boundary surface between two spaces. And then I will have a notion of morphism between morphism that will be a line on one of these boundary surface. And then I will have this higher morphism that will be a dot between this line. So you see that this thing can grow arbitrarily complicated as you want. Uh, Personally, I think that after, let's say the three categorical case, it becomes very difficult to reason uh, about. There are people who are perfectly comfortable with you know, manipulating these five dimensional objects, whatever, I am not that clever. So usually I stick to the um, two dimensional case at most. But you know, with this geometric correspondence, you can keep going and indeed, this is called Poincaré duality. 
So uh, there is a formal mathematical argument that explains why you are allowed to do this. Okay, so now let's dive to probably the most important category of string diagrams out there, which uh, are string diagrams for monoidal categories. So the main idea is very simple. Let's go back to the two category case we say that we have surfaces and that are objects, morphisms between morphisms, uh, sorry, morphisms between objects that are lines and morphisms between morphisms that are dots. But now the idea is what if I consider categories where there's only one object? So, the main idea is that if I only have one object, I can denote it with star. I can basically just consider morphisms from these objects to itself and two morphisms uh, from any morphism to another. Graphically, then what happens is that it doesn't matter anymore that we write or not, we draw or not, these surfaces here, because in this case, the surface will always be one. And so what we have is called string diagrams. Um, so then again, now I'm again, okay, let, let me first do it. Um, so if I have just one object, for instance, this thing just becomes something like this. I'm not writing this, I'm not drawing this, this surface anymore because it's trivial basically. But then I, I still retain all the things that um, I showed you before. So I can basically consider this kind of operation where I put things in, in parallel and I can consider again, this kind of operation here. This is G, this is F, this is call it K, um, where you know I compose things. But now you see that we can we can go back to our previous convention, basically turn everything 90 degrees, and instead of reading things top to bottom, since we basically simplified uh, the surface stuff here, we can again, start reading things left to right. And so I can basically, sorry, I can basically rewrite these things here as eta, theta, this. Now, why are these string diagrams useful? Uh, the reason why they are useful is that they, um, are the graphical calculus for something called monoidal categories. What is a monoidal category? Well, you already know because I told you it's just a two category with one object. Um, but that's not really insightful to understand why a monoidal category is useful. So let's look at these diagrams now. Let's forget for a second about, you know, the, all these, these objects and two category stuff. Now I am dealing with a graphical calculus where I can either plug one thing into the other, uh, like in this way, or I can, ha I have this basically parallel operation here uh, that allows me to consider two things that are as unrelated, but I can consider them at the same time. So this is what a monoidal category gives you. A monoidal category is a category where you not only have a notion of sequential composition between morphisms, but you also have a notion of parallel composition between morphisms. So what I mean is this. In a monoidal category, you have objects that then again, you represent as wires and you can basically consider multiple objects at the same time. So these would be written as A tensor B tensor C. We use this tensor product notation 
to write these things down. And then I can have morphisms like an F that goes from A to let's say A prime, and I can compose them like this. But I can also put morphisms in parallel, and I can also consider morphisms that have more than one input and more than one output. So let's call this K, for instance. So this thing I draw here could be written down as something that goes from A tensor B tensor C, these three wires, applies F tensor K, that is the parallel process that is considering process F and process K in parallel. This will give me an A1 tensor D tensor D prime. And then I am applying a process G tensored with the identity on the tensor D prime. And this will give me an A prime prime D D prime. So you see that this string diagram here is representing exactly this morphism in a monoidal category. Um, but this is way more convenient. Uh, again, you can have, uh, you can prove a lot of things graphically um, without writing them down. We can again prove that, you know, these boxes can slide. So for instance, now it's very easy to prove that this will always be equal to this. Okay. Graphically, this is just a triviality. Again, the only thing that matters is what is connected to what. But if we had to prove it, um, you know, equationally, then I should basically prove that, um, for instance, a way to see it is that A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, is that the identity on A composed with F tensored with G composed with the identity on D is equal to um, F tensored with the identity on C uh, composed with the identity on B tensored with G. And, you know, if you give me this equation, it's not actually trivial. For me, it's actually even difficult to really parse this thing. While graphically, it's absolutely obvious what's going on. I'm just sliding boxes around. Um, other things that we do in these string diagrams calculus is, um, oh yeah, by the way, as I told you, uh, these monoidal categories can always be seen as two categories with only one object. So, the idea is that the objects of a monoidal category become the morphism of these two categories with one object, and the morphisms here become two morphisms here. And basically, you can prove that these two definitions are equivalent. And, and this is useful because, you know, starting from this uh, Poincare duality, we saw that we had a nice uh, graphical calculus for arbitrary two categories, and using the fact that monoidal categories are equivalent to two categories with only one object, we, are a, we were able to specialize this graphical calculus to this one, and so work in this setting. So all these steps are basically formal, and you know you can prove these as, as theorems that this, this graphical calculus actually work. Um, okay, cool. So uh, other. Uh, things um, that I have to tell you is that in any monoidal category, there is an object called I, uh, or that stands for identity, such that for any other object, if you take the tensor, it's like doing nothing. A way to interpret this is, this is the trivial system. This is a system not containing any information. So if you take uh, a system in, you consider a system in parallel with something trivial, you just can forget about it. 
And how do we draw this graphically? Uh, graphically, we draw this uh, by not drawing it. So this is our wire object A, and I is just a wire that is not drawn. And then again, you can see very easily that you know, this equation holds. It's just literally, again, tautology. Um, and you can prove even more interesting things because, for instance, what is a morphism F that goes from I to I? Well, this is just a box, right? Because these wires here and here are invisible. They are not drawn. So this is just a box. And now what I can prove is that if I have two of them, what can I do? I can tensor them, right? This is F tensor G, but wait, only connectivity matters. And since nothing is connected to anything, I can just light them around. So this is the same diagram, but this is really interesting because I basically proved that for F and G going from tensor unit to tensor unit, F tensor G is the same as F composed with G, which obviously will be the same than G tensored with F, and this will be the same of G composed with F. I'm just like keep switching these things around. And you know, if I gave you this equation to prove, that seems not trivial at all. Like why should this be the case? And instead graphically, you can just see that you can move things around and it works. Um, so, okay. Um, what is the main thing that, that we are doing here? What we are doing is we are taking different flavors of categories, like one categories, two categories, monoidal categories that you can see as a special case of um, two categories. And we are giving graphical languages for them. But obviously you won't be able to prove everything graphically. So what I mean is this, let's, let's go to the one categorical case Again, that was a very simple thing where the only thing that we could do was wiring boxes one after the other, okay? Now, let's suppose that um, this F goes from uh, N, uh, from Z to Z, and is just like plus one. So this is taking two and giving me three. And this G is actually doing the opposite. It goes from Z to Z, but this is minus one. So you give me three, I give you two. Then we know that F composed with G will actually be the identity on Z because I'm adding one and subtracting one. So in the end, I'm doing zero. So it is the case that this equation holds. But this is not an equation that our diagrammatic formalism can really see. Like the structural rules of these diagrams, you know, like slide them around, move things around, are only capturing the very needed stuff that a category needs to have to be a category. But then in any category, you may, may have other equations like this one that are not directly captured here. So what is happening is that for each notion, for each flavor of category, in this case, one categories, there is a notion of free category and the way you have to think about free categories are the ca a category that literally has the bare minimum to be a category and doesn't satisfy any other equation. The graphical calculus is equivalent to the free categorical one. So the idea is that everything I can prove in a free category, I can prove graphically and vice versa. If my category is not free, so it satisfies more equations, there is more stuff in my category, then it's um, still true that everything that I prove graphically 
holds in the category, but the opposite is not necessarily. So like in this case, the category may have more equations that are not able to capture uh, graphically. So you see that from this, it becomes uh, a really important to come up with new graphical languages that present new flavors of category. So for instance, in the case of um, two categories, there is a corresponding notion of free two category and we have the surface diagrams I was showing you before. Uh, for uh, monoidal categories, there's a notion of free monoidal categories um, that are the diagrams with the parallel operation I showed you. Um, but in general, if you come up with a new notion of category, you know, maybe uh, I want a category such that blah holds, um, then is there a graphical calculus for this, for this new flavor of categories you invented? Well, maybe, maybe not, but to really answer the question, you'll have to come up with a graphical calculus and prove uh, a soundness and completeness theorem about it. Or you can do the opposite. And actually the opposite is something that um, many people work with. That is, you have a graphical calculus that has a lot of stuff that you want, but not all of it. So you need more stuff. So what, what do you do? Well, you make it up. Uh, so for instance, uh, it may be that I'm working with monoidal categories so I can consider morphisms like this, but now I want a notion that is switch the systems around. Like for instance, if you interpret these objects as systems or as resources and you know, you say, I have an egg and an apple. This is the same thing of saying I have an apple and an egg. So formally you want to introduce a magic switching morphism that allows you to swap systems. And this thing will need to satisfy some equations, obviously. So the most intuitive we can think about is that if I switch C and D, and then I switch them again, then I want these to be equal to the identity. I'm just switching things around without doing anything to them. So if we include this morphism in our picture, what we get is a flavor of monoidal categories that are called symmetric monoidal category. And this thing here is called the symmetry. But wait, maybe this thing is too strong for me. Uh, so maybe I want to keep track of how I permute things. An example of this is knots. If I have a knot, It really matters, you know, what goes up and what goes down, because in some cases I can undo the knot and in some other cases I cannot. So how do I formalize this? Well, I will have another kind of symmetry in my picture where I keep track of what's going up and what's going down. And now you see that this equation changes because it will be true that this equals to the identity equals the identity because if you pull these wires, you know, this is always up, this is always down and they disentangle, but it won't be the case anymore that this is the identity. Because now if you try to pull, you know, you get, you get a knot, these, these are jammed, you, 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 you can't disentangle them anymore. So if you, want this weakened notion of symmetry, then what you will have is, what you have is called a braid. And there is a notion of braided monoidal categories for which this graphical calculus is exactly the right one. Let me give you another notion. Another notion we could um, be interested in is feedback. So maybe if I have a morphism like this, B, C, and this is B again now, now we see that since this is B and this is B, I may want to consider an operation 
in which I feed the output of F back to F. And this operation is called a trace. And categories that satisfy these graphical calculus are called traced monoidal categories. Uh, a very insightful example of this is the category of vector spaces and linear applications between them. In this case, these become just vector spaces and this is basically a matrix and then these really becomes taking the trace of a matrix, which is a common operation in linear algebra. Similarly, in the case of vector spaces, this tensor product is really the tensor product of vector spaces. Um, that basically is equivalent to considering two systems in parallel in a linear algebraic context. Um, there are even other flavors of, of categories, uh, monoidal categories and string diagrams that are worth noticing. So another one is, uh, that is very useful in uh, quantum mechanics is having a magic wire that allows me to turn an input into an output. So how does it work? Well, it's just this. If I have these two things here, then you see that every time I have an F that goes from A to B, I can basically turn this, in, this output into an input. And so consider this. This seems very counterintuitive if you are thinking about these things as sets uh, and functions between them. And this is precisely because the category of sets and functions is not, doesn't not have these magic morphisms here. But the category of vector spaces, for instance, does. And this is exactly why vector spaces and linear algebra are good to do quantum stuff. Because in quantum theory, you have this thing called process state duality, where basically, you know, you, every time you have a preparation of an experiment, so something like this, um, then you can consider this as it were a process or vice versa. Uh, again, this thing will have to satisfy some um, kind of equation, presumably, and the equations are called snake equations that are basically telling you that if I turn an input, an, out, uh, an output into an input and then into an output again, that's like doing nothing, and the opposite is also true. And a way to interpret this is that you can literally yank these wires. You know, every time you have a snake, you can just pull and, and it's really consistent with this idea that only connectivity matters and these deformations in space don't. Um, and another thing that you can say, see is, wait a second, but you told me about this feedback thing and now you are giving me this couple of things here. So what if I have an F from A, C, B, B, and now I apply this thing here and I apply this thing here and I get the identity here. Does it work? Yes. And indeed you can prove that if your category is compact closed, you can get a trace for free. And how do you prove it? Well, we just did, like literally. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just topology at this point, you know. It's just saying, okay, if you compose these things, you can, you can do loops and, and, and that's it. And there are a lot of other flavors that we can consider um, of these things. But the main idea, and I think this is probably a good thing to, uh, as, as a takeaway message basically, is that sometimes your graphical calculus won't do what you want. It will not be expressive enough, but nothing for, forbids you to make another graphical calculus up, extending it in the way you want to, giving some rules, proving some statements that hold in your new graphical calculus, and then go in search of some categorical structure that is represented by that calculus. Um, so you see that in this sense, stream diagrams are not just, you know, some kind of a uh, weird trick that we can use to do graphical mathematics. They, they, they really are an instrument of investigation that we can use. 
there are a lot of notions of categories that have probably been imagined graphically before and then formalized as you know as we usually do with you know objects morphisms and equations uh, so yeah that's basically it um, about string diagrams that's just really a primer you so you were able to see some different flavors of string diagrams uh, and as I said in the reference I, in the references I gave you uh, you know they, they really go at length uh, presenting how you can use these things and how they, they can be useful. Uh, I hope to, you know, have uh, to having let you understood at, at least a bit how, how this works. And yeah, I think I'm, I'm done and I can take uh, questions now.